Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Park, and welcome to another episode in my Breathe Better, Sleep Better, Live Better expert interview series. In this program series, I invite various experts to talk on subjects related to better breathing and better sleep. In the past, I've had experts in nutrition, fitness, smoking cessation, breathing, and insomnia. And tonight, we're going to discuss a more specific topic, which is maxillomandibular advancement. But first, let me give you some background information. As, you may, as many of you may know, I'm an ear, nose, and throat physician and surgeon with a particular interest in helping people breathe better and sleep better. Many of you come to me with the diagnosis of, of obstructive sleep apnea already, looking for alternatives other than CPAP, which is generally the first line way of treating this condition. If you have obstructive sleep apnea and are frustrated by not being able to tolerate or benefit from standard treatment options, then this teleseminar may be for you. There are many different options for treating sleep apnea. CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure, is the best way of treating sleep apnea, but for certain patients, dental devices are another good option. Surgery should only be the last resort. But in certain people who have tried the non-surgical options, including CPAP, dental devices, as well as eating well, exercising regularly, losing weight, and doing all the right things, surgery may be their only other option. So, by the way, if anybody wants a link to an interview that I did with a respiratory therapist on how you can use your CPAP machine more, effect- more effectively, uh, please let me know at drstevenpark.com. That's D-O-C-T-O-R-S-T-E-V-E-N park.com. Uh, I have another one planned in the near future with a dentist about mandibular advancement devices for sleep apnea. So going on, there are many different surgical procedures for obstructive sleep apnea. This is because there are so many different areas along the entire human airway, upper airway, that can potentially narrow or collapse. And there are many different ways of addressing each individual area. The challenge is in selecting the right patient, the right anatomic area, and the right surgical procedures. Also, you can do one of two things. You can either shrink or tighten the soft tissues of the, uh, soft tissues of the throat, or you can enlarge the bony structures of the jaws. And tonight, we're going to talk about the latter. In the medical fields, sleep apnea surgeries are controversial, evidenced by the many pro and con debates in our journals and meetings. Even, even among surgeons, there's a lot of confusion and controversy about, about this that confounds this problem even further. You can also imagine then how the general public must feel. So tonight, we're going to try to clear up some of this confusion. So get your pens and papers handy and get ready to take lots of notes. During these next 60 minutes, you're going to learn the truth about sleep apnea surgery and if the mandibular, uh, sorry, maxillary mandibular advancement procedure is the right surgery for you, how to avoid the common mistakes that many sleep apnea patients make when undergoing surgery, the one thing you must do prior to having any surgery for sleep apnea, and the two or three critical do's and don'ts of finding the right surgeon for you. So tonight, we're honored to, ha- we're honored to have uh, with us Dr. Casey Lee, who is one of the pioneers and thought leaders in the area of sleep apnea surgery. Uh, he specializes in treatment of obstructive sleep apnea, um, and he's, a, he's actually distinguished as the only surgeon in the world that's triple board certified on the boards of otolaryngology, that's ENT, oral maxillofacial surgery, and facial plastic and reconstructive surgery. Based on his unique background and experience, Dr. Lee has pioneered and refined many sleep apnea surgical techniques. Dr. Lee is also especially well known for his numerous successes with one particular sleep apnea surgical technique called the maxillomandibular advancement or the MMA procedure. While many sleep apnea surgeons can only promise 40% success rates with the traditional palatal operations like the uvular palatal pharyngoplasty, patients who undergo the MMA procedure with Dr. Lee report a success rates as high as 80 to 85%. Dr. Lee is a surgical consultant to numerous sleep disorder centers, including the multidisciplinary sleep treatment team at Stanford Sleep Disorders Clinic. He's published more than 100 scientific articles and book chapters on sleep apnea surgery and maxillofacial surgery. Dr. Lee frequently gives lectures throughout the United States and abroad as an internationally recognized expert in sleep apnea surgery. So with that all said, welcome, Dr. Lee. It's truly thank an honor to have you with us tonight. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Park. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I will do my best to answer all the questions. So what got you interested in doing sleep apnea surgery, and uh, also how did you become so experienced with this procedure? Well, um, I, I first uh, went to dental school and uh, became a, a dentist and, and then oral surgeon. And uh, somehow I, I felt that I wanted to get more training and went into otolaryngology, which is ENT, and, and sort of the combined 
both both specialty deals with the with the oral facial airway uh, area and sleep apnea is just one of those things that uh, I think it, it crosses uh, specialty lines and uh, with with the with the background that I have, it, it just sort of uh, naturally uh, suited for treatment of sleep apnea because it, it really is a uh, it's a multi uh, specialty problem, and uh, no, I don't think uh, any one specialty could uh, claim uh, to be uh, the only uh, specialty that deal with that deals with um, sleep apnea. So, with, with, my, with my background, it it sort of a natural fit to um, to deal with the with the sort of the bony and the soft tissue structure of the airway that that involves in sleep apnea. So um, before we start the questions, I know we didn't discuss this beforehand, but can you just give us a brief talk or your basic principles on, on sleep apnea, how you manage sleep apnea patients in general and the surgery behind it before we talk about this specific procedure? Sure. Um, uh, no, surgery is not for everyone. Um, the the problem is that I I see I see so many patients with sleep apnea and the problem is that we're getting better and better and better in diagnosing patients with sleep apnea but the treatment really hasn't changed a whole lot it, it's uh, you know we have nasal CPAP we have oral appliance we have different forms of surgery and uh, although CPAP's getting better but um, you know I have I see a lot of patients who not only um, you know, some people can use it, some can't. Even people that can use it, a lot of people struggle with it, and they're barely, you know, uh, functioning. And and I think the myth of, of CPAP is that just because you could use it doesn't mean that uh, your sleep apnea is eliminated. Majority, overwhelming majority of people with uh, nasal CPAP have varying degree of sleep apnea. They may be better. So the goal of treatment, of any treatment, is to reduce the severity of sleep apnea. It's CPAP. It's surgery and it's oral appliance. Now, obviously, uh, in terms of uh, treating patients, we want to provide them with the least invasive type of treatment modality that will be able to help them. Uh, I think the key to me is to provide patients with options. I see a lot of patients where uh, they're unable to use CPAP, and but uh, their individual sleep physicians uh, don't offer them all other treatment alternatives and tell them that, CPAP is the only option. Well, I I would certainly strong, strongly disagree with that, but I would certainly agree that CPAP is the ideal treatment as is and should be the first line treatment for everyone. And I, if they're unable to use nasal CPAP and sometimes they simply choose not to use nasal CPAP, then I think it's our job to provide them with um, to educate them with. Uh, options and to try to accurately provide them with uh, the potential outcomes of other, other treatment options such as oral appliance or surgery. So I do see a lot of patients and a lot of times I tell patients that uh, they really shouldn't consider surgery or, or, but most of the time I really try to encourage them to use nasal CPAP because I think it is potentially the best treatment option. Actually, one of my, one of my experiences is that um, in many cases, uh, I'm sure you agree with this, they have, they'll have nasal congestion. Yes. And that's something that we can help them very easily with, and that can actually alone help them use CPAP much more effectively. Absolutely. I I uh, I think um, you know every sleep physician should evaluate uh, the patient's nose because nasal congestion and problem with the the nose is a uh, is a common problem in patients with nasal CPAP use. So yes, I do a lot of nasal surgery uh, to try to improve the patient's tolerance to nasal CPAP. You're absolutely right, and I absolutely agree with you. So um, once you get to the point or the, make the decision to go for surgery, how do you decide what kind of surgery to do? Uh, in, there are there are a lot of factors in terms of. Um, uh, that influences that influence the outcomes of of sleep apnea surgery. Um, you know the patient's age, the patient's weight, the architecture of the airway, i.e., the, the soft tissues, uh, tonsils, or or in the jaw. And uh, so, I, I think, and also the success rate of of an operation varies. Depending on the patient's anatomy, the age, and and all those factors. So when I try when I see patients, I I, I try to uh, present them with 
the potential outcomes of uh, sort of individual procedures. For example, there are two, as you mentioned, there are two main approaches. One, I sort of use the uh, the, the uh, crowded room uh, analogy. Um, the crowd, the the room being a small room uh, due to small jaw, and uh, the crowded room is basically excess soft tissues, large tonsils, and what have you. And so, either try to uh, relieve the crowded room by removing some furnitures, or try to expand the room by pushing the walls apart, which is the jaw surgery. So, when I see a patient, I I try to uh, look at the anatomy and look at the severity of sleep apnea, and obviously their uh, patients' uh, body habitus could influence the outcome. Patients who are overweight, uh, you know, the obesity can be a major factor of of, uh, sleep apnea, therefore can negatively influence the outcome of of airway surgery. I don't feel that... uh, Someone who's uh, a patient who is uh, very overweight, I don't think they're particularly suited for airway surgery for the treatment of sleep apnea. Um, these patients uh, should have the weight under control, potentially even nasal CPAP or even uh, bariatric surgery before airway surgery uh, should be really considered for uh, for their sleep apnea. But really, it's, uh, it's individually based. I, I try to look at uh, all the potential factors that influence the outcome and present um, uh, individual patients with different uh, scenarios, so to speak, with different types of surgery and different types of outcomes. Uh, I think so, that in patients with severe sleep apnea, uh, it's pretty, uh, unless the patient has significant soft tissue redundancy, a lot of times I see patients with sleep apnea where there's there, there are minimal soft tissue redundancy or there uh, there are no tonsils. There are prior tonsillectomy. My feelings on those patients are are that uh, I actually strongly discourage them to have surgery unless they're going to consider jaw surgery, uh, because the likelihood of soft tissue surgery such as pharyngoplasty and tonsillectomy and that sort of things are are um, going to be very low. And I think that uh, I think that is. I think that is the most important aspect in educating patients and, and relaying accurate information in terms of what to expect from uh, from sleep apnea surgery. So at what kind of patients are good candidates for this MMA procedure, and how do you arrive at that decision? Well, um, this type of surgery is really is um, it's something that I do... Um, you know, anywhere probably one to three a week. It is, uh, uh, you know, compared to most surgeons, I do do a fair number of them. Um, it's, it's. You no, know, I would say that uh, I don't, uh, I think a, a general statement is that I don't believe that patients who are older are, are good candidates, meaning that uh, I try to not to offer surgery and patients who are uh, beyond sort of their mid 60s, because I feel that um, in in the aging population, sleep apnea surgery results um, is not great. Uh, patients uh, actually have performed this type of you, surgery. You, I'm sorry. You're talking about. Inter- I'm sorry. You're, you're talking about result, surgical results or complications just due to their age. Like, uh, surgical age. results. Okay. I feel that older patients, because of the the tissue laxity, uh, that uh, they generally uh, don't do as well in terms of uh, reduction of the severity of sleep apnea as compared okay. to younger okay. patients. Because I think that's one of the that's one of the underlying problem is the the upper the upper airway collapse in uh, in impacting and injuring, having micro injury to the soft tissue linings with aging, with airway obstruction, with repeated uh, upper airway obstruction uh, in time, these tissues are just so damaged that uh, when we get older, it's, I think that probably nasal CPAP really is the, uh, the only thing that should be considered as opposed to surgery. I just don't feel that surgery is, is, is great for, for the senior population. In terms of... Um, who are the good candidates? Um, I, you know, I, I have performed this type of surgery in, uh, in you know, teenagers all the way up to patients who are you know, in the early 60s. Um, I don't feel that this type of surgery should be suited, as I mentioned, for patients who are obese because uh, their success rate uh, with any airway surgery, including maximum advancement surgery, is not going to be 
great since obesity is is a major um, factor f- for their sleep apnea, not not so much their airway problem. Um, but I, other than that, I think most people are candidates have are for this type of surgery if they choose to have it. I usually present this operation as an option. Patients choose to have this surgery because they've uh, they're ha- they just are suffering so much they can't uh, they might have a lot of them have tried other procedures some have not and they're they're um, uh, barely hanging on and uh, they they wanted to improve their situation um, so now, do I, you do this as part of a stage procedure like do, do, I, or is I, it as primary I, surgery I do both. Uh, some pa- for for example, uh, I will give you a couple of examples. If I see an individual uh, patient where that sleep apnea is severe, and the patient is not very much overweight, um, and there's uh, there's minimal soft tissue redundancy, so the soft palate. Uh, is uh, it's not very excessive, and the there the tonsil is either very small or a patient has had prior tonsillectomy, uh, and given in the in face of severe sleep apnea, I feel that jaw surgery is pretty much the only good option in terms of surgical management. So I would do jaw surgery as as the single uh, procedure, as opposed to someone who may have very large tonsils. And that uh, you know, I will feel I feel that uh, the patient should have the soft tissue treated, uh, and potentially they could have very good response uh, from the soft tissue surgery before going to jaw surgery. And even if patient the patient uh, may choose to have jaw surgery, I would still recommend uh, having the tonsils removed, whether it's uh, as a as a first uh, stage surgery, having the soft tissue surgery, or even having a having a, as a second stage surgery after the jaw surgery, I feel that the more you deal, the more you try to expand the airway, uh, the better the outcome, not just short term outcome, but the long term right. outcome. And you're also including tongue surgery too, right? The soft tissue. I do surgery. do some tongue surgery, uh, such as genial glasses advancement. There's uh, also, you know, the the repose using a suture. There, there are a lot of sort of a high O advancement. A lot of those sort of tongue procedures. Um, I do do them, but uh, they're they, in general they're not my favorite procedures, uh, simply because they are not they're not nearly as predictable as jaw surgery, and often patients have tried those surgeries and, and the improvement is just it's more to be de, uh, desired in terms of uh, the outcome. So they're, not that they don't work, uh, the impact is not nearly as good as, as the MMA, and uh, a lot of times they don't work. So it's, hard, it's, it's unpredictable, the outcomes of, of those procedures. So what kind of tests do you order uh, in preparation for an MRA. Well, um, I'm I'm just a I'm just a plumber, you know. I'm just an airway plumber. I I, I sort of look at the airway, I uh, with a scope just to make sure that I'm not missing any anything unusual. Um, and uh, obviously, I need to have a an accurate uh, sleep study for the diagnosis. I take some X-rays. Uh, to to evaluate the bone structure, uh, look at the the teeth and the bite. Um, that's pretty much all all I need. You know, some people, my, my I'm sort of I'm very simple minded. I, I don't like to do fancy tests that are not going to help me in treating patients. Some people talk about sleep endoscopy. I don't believe that in one iota. Some people talk about MRIs or CT or what have you. I, I tell patients that they could do all those things, but what you find from the, from all those fancy tests are not going to change one's recommendation. So if if, if I'm not going to change my recommendations, there's no reason to put the patient uh, through all these fancy tests. That that's not going to help them. At the end of the day, we only have certain number of treatment modalities. So um knowing that uh the patient uh the patient's airway dimension is uh you know uh 
1.75 centimeters uh, across uh, based on a CT scan is not going to change what we what we have to offer. I don't know like if that makes very, sense. Yeah, absolutely. We have to. I think we have very similar treatment for philosophies. Um, I have many patients that demand X-rays, you know, CAT scans and imaging in preparation for their sleep apnea surgery. And I tell them, I see what's going on. Uh, it's not going to change my management. Right. I totally agree with your 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 um what you're saying. So um now let's say that your patient's very interested. How do you go about counseling these patients in terms of the pre-op counseling? Well, I I obviously I I try to present them with what I uh, anticipate as a as an outcome. Uh, first of all, I tell patients that there are no guarantees with any surgery. And uh, which is which is true, obviously. And I can only um, estimate the potential success rate. And I and I I would say based on I don't know five six hundred of these cases uh, for sleep apnea, I would say that put the ninety percent of patients that have significant improvement, and uh, and most of the time this improvement is dramatic. And uh, I would say often it's a it's a life changing operation, but patients do have to go through the operation. Uh, it's not a small operation. It is not open heart surgery, but it's an operation that typically takes me uh, on average far around the four hours. And um, so they're in the hospital a couple nights. They cannot chew for four weeks. The jaws weak. So they cannot chew. It will be liquid diet, and it takes going to take a few months for them to uh, go back to to normal uh, normal food. So it is uh, it is a long recovery, uh, and uh, and most most of the time patients take uh, take about a month, a few weeks off work. So it's a long recovery, and it's um, it's a commitment, but majority of time it's a. Uh, it, it's a, it's a worthwhile uh, commitment because most patients do feel uh, significantly significantly better. Um, but um, it's yeah, yeah, it, one one question that I'm sure you're going to get is, does it hurt or how much does it hurt? Well, uh, majority of the time, this operation is does not hurt as much as tonsillectomy or pharyngoplasty. It is a different type of recovery. I tell patients that when, uh, when I talk to patients about uh, throat surgery, I tell them that it's a very sh- it's sharp pain, it's a very bad sore throat, and uh, it's very hard to swallow uh, for a few days, and that's the throat surgery. For the jaw surgery, I tell them that it's, uh, it's as if they got beaten up. You know, they're, they're swollen, they're achy, uh, but in terms of the level of pain, it is not an operation that people would say it's severe pain. I would say it's moderate amount of pain um, that uh, certainly requires pain medication. And the range of pain medication um, varies between individuals. As, as you well know, Dr. Park, that patient's pain tolerance is extremely variable. I've had a uh, number of patients that don't take any pain medications after this operation, which is unusual, but certainly had a few. And or on the extreme, I've had patients who take pain medications uh, at four, five, six weeks. Now that's uh, that's the other extreme. Most of the time, patients are off off of pain medications after a couple weeks. Are their jaws wired shut? Uh, no, I do not wire patients' jaws shut. I usually keep their jaws. Uh, uh, opening very limited with uh, fairly firm rubber bands and every week I see my patients every week and their rubber bands uh, come off gradually so patients could have uh, increasing uh, range of motion of their jaws uh, uh, every week gradually. And when can they go back to work? Most of the time it it, it really involves um, what they do. I usually recommend about three or four weeks off, most most time a month off. But if if it's a salesperson, if it's uh, an individual that speaks for a living, I tend to recommend probably six weeks so that uh, they're they have a, a longer healing period. It's not unlike uh, orthopedic surgery. Uh, I tell patients that you know if you have a if you've had a knee operation, you're not going to go uh, run two miles uh, in two weeks. So it's a it's it's 
takes it does take some time to for the jaw to uh, solidify to firm up and to get stronger so it's going to take time and i think that's probably the most frustrating um area for patients is that you know they feel pretty good but they can't uh they can't chew hard food you know it's the people usually start out with uh, some macaroni and cheese and egg product after about a month and they gradually build up the back to steaks and that sort of thing. Age has a lot to do with it. Um, younger patients, I do actually do a fair number of this type of surgery for teenagers. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of teenagers have uh, uh, pretty significant sleep apnea. And, you know, you take a 17-year-old, they're <laughs> it's amazing how, how fast they healed and uh, they're back in chewing hamburger in a couple months. Now, actually, um, getting back to more of a technical question, uh, how how far forward do you actually move the upper and lower jaws? Um, it, can, you actually, it, can you actually describe just in brief, in layman's terms, what you do? Sure. Uh, everything is done, in, essentially everything is done inside the mouth. So uh, a, a very, very, very small, the way I do it, very, very small incisions on the, on the cheek, which is about five millimeter um, uh, length, which is very small on either side of the cheek, just this, which allows me to place some pins through the through the cheek into the into the jawbone. It's just basically uh, ease of placement. So basically, um, a cut is made inside the mouth on the on the upper gum, um, uh, right the sort of the roots of the upper jaw, and a cut on the bone is made uh, straight across uh, above the roots of the teeth, which separates the upper jaw. Uh, from from the skull, essentially. So you pull the up, you move the upper this uh, teeth area forward, and you stabilize it with uh, very small titanium plates, which you don't feel. So it's this, it stabilizes the uh, the segments, and the the bone will fuse and heals and becomes one piece again. Kind of kind of like how a broken bone heals. And the lower jaw area is cut uh, as a uh, kind of a diagonal um, pattern on. Uh, on where the wisdom teeth are located, so the jaw joint stays stays put. It does; uh, they don't go anywhere. But the the teeth part is uh, lengthened. It's moved forward, and then about uh, how much? Uh, majority of time, uh, well, my it, the way that I try to determine how far to move an individual has uh, it, basically it's how. The patient's facial aesthetics uh, determines, and uh, their sleep apnea. Uh, my my range of uh, advancement for patients with sleep apnea it's anywhere between ten to twenty millimeters. Okay. So about, uh, that's like about half an inch or so. Yeah, about half an inch or yeah. so. Yeah. Um, it's uh, yeah about half an inch or so, but it depends on the individual. A, a, a very thin woman. Um, that uh, that that she is not going to look very good if you advance her 20 millimeters. And so, at the end of the day, there are some tricks that I use in terms of how I manipulate the jaw and trying to maximize the airway airway opening, jaw advancement, and to try to sort of. Um, uh, at the same time, to lessen the facial changes, and, and there's some, it's 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 a little more um, uh, technical and uh, to to talk about it, but there there are ways to try to lessen the facial changes and make it more pleasing instead of just uh, just just sort of pull things forward for for everybody. So every individual face is different. At the end of the day, there are two. Um, the two factors that are opposing each other. One is that you want to try to move the jaws forward. The more you move forward, the the better the airway is going to open. But the more you move the fo- move the jaws forward, you're going to impact on the facial aesthetics. Most of the time, people patients look uh, fine, and a lot of times people actually look better. But I emphasize to patients that their their face they're they're going to look different, and um, and that is it's more from a profile of you, right, rather than from a front um, of both. View. Actually, both. Uh-huh. The front of view, they're going to look a bit different, and profile view, certainly, they're going to look different. And that, you know, you talk about an operation, 
in terms of preoperative counseling, I would tell you that I spend I spend probably 75% of the time talking about facial changes because I think it's at the end of the day someone who's who may sleep great but they hate the way they look it's a failure. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine, so yeah. um so I I you know I know people that don't even broach the subject and uh I I think that's I don't think that's the right approach. I think it's, you know, this day and age, people need to know exactly what they're getting into, what to expect, um, and so on and so forth. Okay. So let's talk about some possible complications. What are some of the more common complications that you see? Well, majority of the time, I tell patients that uh, you know they could have a certain degree of numbness of the uh, lower lip and the chin and maybe a certain area of the gums. Uh, believe it or not, that is uh, it is rare. I would say I probably had less than a handful of patients that come back and tell me that uh, they have numbness that bothers them. So um, in general, the numbness is related, uh, has a lot to do with age. Uh, younger patients, I just, I, I you know, teenagers, uh, patients in their 20s, 30s, uh, it's, uh, it's extremely uncommon in my, in my experience to have uh, to complain of uh, in numbness. Older patients tend to have uh, more numbness, usually numbness around the, the upper gums or occasionally the uh, the lower lip and the chin area. I usually tell patients that overall it's probably about a 10% uh, incidence of some uh, residual numbness, uh, which can which is permanent. Uh, totally numb is very very uncommon. So that numbness is one. Uh, the changing of the bite. The bite doesn't meet perfectly. It certainly can happen. I would say probably f- five to ten percent of the time they may require a little dental work. Worst case scenario will be requiring orthodontia. That is uh, not common. Certainly less than ten percent. Um, to me, the biggest the biggest problem is uh, the biggest complication is uh, lack of improvement. Uh, that can happen. Luckily, uh, fortunately, it's not very common, but certainly can happen. What happens when that happens? Uh, well, <laughs> it's a it's a bummer for everybody, and yeah. uh, you know, at that point, we're sort of run out of tricks. And uh, if the patient if the patient is not improved at all, then you know, uh, I have not met an individual that wants to have a tracheotomy. So they may, they'll probably go back to nasal CPAP if they could use it. Sometimes uh, they may not have enough improvement. They may have a 50% improvement, which is not a not a, which is considered a failure in, in my book in terms of MMA surgery. That they if they still have some soft tissue, they could have some soft tissue surgery. But um, you know, the we sort of run out of options if MMA doesn't but, work. Actually, there was one question here I wanted to ask you before. Um, when, after the surgery, how quickly do they feel the results? Uh, that is an excellent question. I have had patients who have told me the next day when I go in to see them, they say that, you know, uh, I already sleep better. I, I dreamt last night. I don't remember the last time I, I, I had a dream. So some people feel... Uh, and improve sleep even even when even when they're in the hospital while they're still in the hospital because even though you have swelling the airway is so much bigger and uh so the sleep apnea is already better despite the edema um, sometimes it takes pe- some people a few weeks to feel better so i would say it, it ranges probably somewhere around you know 1 to 2 weeks to 6 weeks something like that. Now, before we go on to some of these more logistical questions about the surgery, I had a couple other um, questions for you, and, and I don't think we went over this in our pre-interview, but what do you think about, I mean, or do you have any experience with, because um, what you're doing is you're pulling the jaws forward, but what, what about widening your palates and widening your jaws? I know that you can do it much easier in children with the palatal expansion. Uh, yes. And adults too? Yes. Um, actually, I, I, um, 
recommend a lot of palatal widening. You could widen the upper and lower jaw with orthodontia. I recommend that uh, most uh, in children all the time, uh, fairly routinely. Uh, I've also done surgical widening with uh, in adults. The widening procedure does help, but it's not nearly as effective as MMA. Um, so. W- when I see patients, um, if, if someone someone that has um, sort of mildish, sort of to low moderate sleep apnea, if their jaws are very narrow, then I will present whining as an option. But the success rate is not comparable in terms of uh, how how um, how old. Well, what's the cutoff line for orthodontic widening in children? Well, sort of, uh, you could probably go to uh, up to. You know, uh, 12, 13, 14, and this day and, this day and age, the, the kids develop so so rapid, you know, so fast. They they mature so quickly. At, up to sort of very low teens, I think that's about the best you could you could do. Okay. And do you know anyone that's doing distraction osteogenesis regularly? Uh, I do or that. Sleep apnea uh, regularly. Yeah, you do. Well, um, you? <laughs> but so you know what? That? I'm sorry. <laughs> what's your experience with that? The wine. Well. It depends well, on what you. Yeah, let Go me ahead. let me explain for the listeners what what that is. This is where they, for example, if you take a piece of bone and you cut it, and after a few days you have this callus that forms. And what you do is you have, you put these uh, rods or plates that are actually expandable. You, you kind of tighten a screw, and it actually expands the the two parts of the bones apart very slowly. So you do it little by little, day by day, and you can get significant uh, expansion. Or lengthening of your bones, so you can apply the same thing to the facial bones. Um, actually, uh, the widening in uh, the surgical widening is mm-hmm. distraction osteogenesis uh, to to widen it. Um, so that that is one thing. If you're okay. talking about advancing the jaw with with uh, distraction osteogenesis, I published a paper quite a few years ago and and. and Doing that with with adult patients, um, distraction, but it is really not a very good technique for adult patients because you have to put in this. It's it's additional surgery. You have to place the distractor. Uh, you have to still have to put, do the bone cut. The the the, uh, the bone cut is is uh, just as complicated, and the surgical time is just as long uh, compared to a standard MMA, and then. Uh, you the surgery the the treatment actually just begins uh, a week after the surgery. You have to turn the distractor, and then it takes at least a couple weeks, if not more, for the jaw to be advanced. And one of the biggest problem is that because for sleep apnea the distance of advancement needs to be great. So there's more of a fulcrum arm because if you're advancing the jaw with ho- only the distractor holding it. So the patient's uh, diet is limited for a long time, and uh, there, and then you have to go back to surgery to remove the distractor. So that's an additional surgery. I don't think distractor distraction osteogenesis is, is uh, really suited for adult patients. It certainly is an ideal treatment for uh, for kids who are uh, syndromic with craniofacial right. syndrome with with a, a very significant uh, airway obstruction. And uh, they are ideal candidates for distraction osteogenesis. So. Sure. I've seen some amazing results in, in ch- young children and mm-hmm. toddlers uh, with these really, really uh, you know, malformed jaws. It's, right. It's amazing now, what you can do with them. Right. Now, the obviously, most of those patients have sleep apnea, but the mm-hmm. but the, mo- the the number one indication for operating on the, on those children are really for their malformation. For their not just for the for the uh, airway, but also for aesthetics or for their cranial synapse, or, or what have you. So, uh, there, sleep apnea is there. There's so many kids that runs runs around with sleep apnea. Now, I, I always say that you know when you have a craniofacial uh, syndromic child, you have the license to operate. You could do, you could put in distractors, you could do all these things. No one's going to question you why you're doing it. But you, if you have a quote unquote normal child, normal appearing child, the child has severe sleep apnea, then 
people are, if you do all sorts of surgery on them, people are going to question you, why, why are you doing all these very, very aggressive surgery? Because the child looks okay. Uh, so it's it's the the sort of the tolerance for um, for oper- I'm I'm sort of going off a tangent, but it's okay. This is fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, it, it's you know, but a lot of kids. I'm you know, a lot of kids. I'll I'll, I'll just touch on kids. Uh, you know, our 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 uh, uh, primary treatment for children is adenal tonsillectomy, but right. overwhelming majority of children continue to have sleep apnea after adenal tonsillectomy. Right. And, uh, you know, what can we do for them? Not a whole lot. You know, you, we could well, put them on nasal CPAP. A, I'm sorry? Yeah, but wasn't there, wasn't there a study recently out of Stanford where they, they combined the tonsillectomy with palatal advancement? And oh, sure, sure. Big, I mean, we, we could... Result? Yes. I mean, obviously, but, but what I'm saying is that we could do orthodontic treatment. We could combine an orthodontic treatment with adenal tonsillectomy. That helps them. But a lot of, you know, there, there are number of kids and fairly number of kids that if they have very small jaw, even with the widening, it's still not going to be enough. That's true. Exactly. So not it's, enough, uh, right. and, and you know, these kids, they grow up to be adults with sleep apnea. Right. <laughs> I don't know if you got a, a chance to um, read my book yet. Oh yeah, no, yeah, I've, it's, it's yeah. a, it's a great, it's a great, I yeah. think it's very helpful, very helpful for, for, for really for everyone, you know, it, it, I always, I always tell patients that uh, you know patients come in they're sort of at the at, at the end of the rope so to speak you know they're really suffering and and you know I tell them that sleep is sleep is such a, a important aspect but not being able to sleep well uh, impacts on their whole uh, lifestyle and their, their quality of life and even if you improve and they people have been suffering for so long even if you just improve their sleep apnea sometimes they're it, um, it sort of amass uh, other aspect of you know a lot of people are on uh, and that depressants and and all these things that uh, you know certainly improvement of sleep apnea is one aspect but there are other parts of uh, their sleep um that may not be helped and they that's going to take other efforts to try to improve the other aspects, such as insom- insomnia and what have you. Sure, totally agree. I, I just wanted to make the point that um, in my book, Sleep Interrupted, um, I point out that uh, for whatever reason, um, I think that I think I don't know if you agree with me or not, but dentists think that um, dental crowding is much more rampant these days than than even a couple hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. That for some reason our jaws are just more crowded. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, uh, there's a lot of dentists that think that um, through the bottle feeding that we have more dental crowding too. And that yes, there's a whole bunch of other questions, and <laughs> controversies. Right, and, uh, these are pretty topic. controversial topic, yeah. and uh, yes, it's you know it's it's, it's certainly is is possible, but you know also, uh, you know there, there's uh, you know maybe it's an evolution type of changes, uh, maybe it's uh, bottle it's feeding. Evolution. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, because, well, anyway, well, let, me, let me just go back to the questions. We kind of diverged a little bit. Um, <clears throat> oh, so the so next question is, is it covered by insurance in general? Most of the time, it is covered by insurance. Uh, some insurance companies uh, require that pa- patients have tried the soft tissue surgery first. Uh, some don't. and uh, But uh, most of the time, it is covered by insurance. And if someone doesn't have insurance or they have to pay out of pocket, how much does it cost? On average? Well, uh, it, it, at, it, at it depends. <laughs> it depends on the hospital. It, it, I mean, uh-huh. because patients, it's this is not an outpatient surgery. Yeah. So it, it depends on the hospitalization. It depends. So I would say, depending on where you go, I would say probably anywhere. Um, if if an individual has severe sleep apnea, I certainly would recommend uh, the first night being the, stay in the ICU for observation. So I would, depending on the hospital, I would probably stay anywhere between I don't know, uh, forty to eighty thousand dollars, something like yeah, that. That sounds about right. Yeah, hospital yeah. costs are very high. Right. Yeah, I'm sure your your fees are just a small fraction of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you're you're in New York. I'm in uh, Northern California. <laughs> right. Cost of living is uh, probably about the same. Well, probably New York's a little higher. I thought, I thought San Francisco was higher. Oh, is it? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, that's what I heard. 
I don't know. I I remember the, the last time when I was in New York for for a meal, it, it wasn't cheap. <laughs> Now, I've gotten a number of these similar, similar questions. So if they can't fly in to see you, come to San Francisco to see you, and they wanted to find a surgeon locally to perform this operation, um, what are some recommendations that you can make? What are some do's and don'ts? Um, uh, this is a question that's, that, that people uh, call me and email me and they ask me. You know, what I would recommend is that they, could, they should find someone who does First of all, they need to find someone who does jaw surgery routinely, which is not many to begin with. Someone who does jaw surgery routinely, when I say routine, they really need to do it. I mean, at the minimum, at the minimum, a couple times a month. You know, I, I, uh, that, that really is, is, I think, the minimum. Second is that they need uh, treating the sleep apnea is very different. Um, and treating sort of bad bite. And I think patients should um, ask the surgeon whether they have any experience and also get a couple of three of their the people that they've, they've treated and speak to them and find out their experience. Someone who tells you that, oh, I do this all the time, and they can't give you a name or two, of the people that they've uh, treated in the past, you probably don't want this patient, this surgeon, to, to treat you. So that's typically what I would recommend in terms of just asking the surgeon and asking uh, some references. Um, actually, another patient asked a very similar question, and he asks you, Dr. Lee, if you had OSA and it was a candidate for this procedure but couldn't go to Stanford, um, he actually wants you to give names and cities where you would uh, where, we, where you would go. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. I guess yeah. I a, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, I, mean, I, I guess they're prominent. They're prominent academics in, in major academic medical centers, right? That that do this. Yeah, I, I would. You know, I would just go to your academic centers and and see if you could. Uh, again, uh, the the recommendation stands. It's uh, find out some people that they've treated and talk to them. Yeah, I think that's that's a great recommendation. I did that for my patients as well. So um, let's go on to some of these other questions that we uh, discussed before. It's a little bit off topic, but I think it's relevant um, while we're talking about the subject. So M Mr. Michael Soffler asks, what are the main reasons for UPPP with tonsillectomy, septoplasty, toroplasty not having long-term permanent success after five years? So why well, do these operations fail? Uh, well, that's an excellent question, and let me answer it this way. First of all, nobody cures sleep apnea. Okay, nothing cures sleep apnea other than cutting someone's head off, <laughs> because sleep apnea is the result of gradual airway of airway obstruction. The, our our airway is a dynamic structure, so as as we when we are asleep, the tissues become floppy. Now there are there are two main factors in terms of how the airway collapses. You, you already know that the, 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 the tissues are floppy. So number one, an individual that has a small airway to begin with, okay, so that the airway obstruction becomes easier in that individual. That's number one. And that's well demonstrated. People with sleep apnea have a smaller airway compared to people without sleep apnea. Second is the collapsibility of airway. Some people's muscles, the, there's greater neuromuscular relaxation in that individual compared to others. Also, when sleep apnea, the natural history of sleep apnea it gradually worsens with aging. It doesn't matter whether you treat someone with nasal CPAP or treat someone with oral appliance, there's going to be gradual deterioration of their airway. And there are a lot of times that, that CPAP gradually doesn't work. I see that all the time. People may get some initial improvement for three months, for a couple of years, for three years, and then it gradually doesn't work. Now, a lot of times you have, to, most of the time you you have to increase their pressure, but even with, even then, the 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 improvement isn't as good as in the, as the beginning. So every treatment has deterioration, not just surgery. Now, also because palatal and some of those soft tissue surgeries 
although after the surgery patients are improved, but they still have some sleep apnea. Okay, so sleep apnea, when you have sleep apnea, patients increase their effort to breathe. So basically, when you increase your effort to breathe, you're sucking that airway in. Added to, in addition to when people snore, they cause some localized trauma to the tissues. So tissues become floppier and floppier, so there's sort of a, a snowball effect that gradually gets worse and worse with aging. And when I, tell, when I talk to people about sleep apnea surgery, I use the uh, facial plastic surgery analogy. Someone who's 75 years old comes in for a facelift surgery. You could do, this, you could do a facelift surgery. The 75-year-old woman looks 60. When this, when this patient is 90, they're not going to look 60. They look better than when they're 90 compared if, to if uh, they, they did not have the facelift surgery. But... Nothing that they're not going to look exactly the same as, as a month after their initial surgery. Same as sleep apnea. Does that sure that makes yeah that does makes that make sense? sense? Yep. Okay. And the reason that uh, MMA surgery lasts a lot longer is the impact of the airway improvement, the impact of sleep apnea reduction. Sure, it's like, it's like that analogy you gave before about widening the walls. It's you widening the skeletal support structure. Right. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. So let's go to the next question. Mr. Ken Rock asks: Is it true that the number one side effect of MMA surgery is damage to the alveolar nerve, which results in permanent loss of feeling or numbness? Uh, I sort of talked about that. You can have certainly have some certain degree of numbness. Total numbness is, uh, in my experience, is is very uncommon. Um, is it a number one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, that... One of the more common ones? Yeah, one of the more that, common ones, yeah. yeah. I will probably but, say which so. Which is not that common, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then um, Dr. Laura Cosarelli asks, what are the success rates of your surgeries on relatively young, non-obese women with UARS, or upper airway resistance syndrome? Would yeah, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I, will, I will make one claim. that I probably treated more UARS patients surgically than anybody else in the world since Christian Gimeno is at uh, Stanford. Right. <laughs> uh, UARS is, the treatment of UARS is not unlike the treatment of sleep apnea. The problem with UARS is, is, is or, or my, by the way, I've operated... And I've done jaw surgery or MMA surgery on patients with mild sleep apnea. You know, people will say, oh, my God, you know, he is so aggressive in, uh, in doing this type of surgery, even for patients with mild sleep apnea. But, you know, you, patients, with UAR, patients with UARS and, um, and people with sleep apnea, the symptoms oh, of sleep you know, be, Before you go on, let me ex explain what UARS is to our okay. listeners. Um, it's upper airway resistance syndrome. And it, simply put, it's, it's kind of a milder version of sleep apnea, but you don't show up as having sleep apnea on a, on a sleep study. So some people think it's a, it's a, t a totally distinct entity, and some others think that it's along a continuum. But basically, it's when you're really tired, and the sleep, uh, the sleep study shows that you don't have any significant sleep apnea, or you, you only have very mild sleep apnea. But I think you and I both agree this is, it's also an anatomic problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, sure. Um, patients with UR certainly uh, also have anatomic problems. It, 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 you know, still, it's airway related, and women tend to have uh, more of a URS picture. The, the issue, the issue is that just because someone with, has mild sleep apnea doesn't mean that their symptoms are mild. I've, right. I've seen patients with very severe debilitating symptoms with, uh, you know, quote unquote mild sleep apnea. Uh, ULRS, the treatment is, is pretty much the same as as, uh, as sleep apnea, and uh, I would I would say that my experience with uh, treating patients with ULRS with uh, with MMA, which is which are not many, I would say it's probably been I don't know 10 to 20, uh, the, and uh, the results are uh, are good. Um, the the key in um, in doing that type of surgery in women, in women with uh, non non obese women uh, obviously uh, you know treating women um, I, it is there's more even more um, attention would need to be 
uh, applied on the on the facial changes, you sure. know, and uh, but uh, overall, the I think this obviously the outcome is is comparable, certainly compared to the general pop to the overall patient pool. So, uh, last question here is: What effect? Ms. Penny Snead asks: What effect or improvement could MMA have on a sleep apnea patient with a receding or underdeveloped chin? Well, um, obviously, when you move the jaws forward, the, the receding chin is going to be improved. Um, a lot, most of the time, patients with sleep apnea do have a small jaw. Sometimes they have a small chin. Obviously, you're going to lengthen the jaw, and sometimes you have to do some to the chin. But uh, overall, uh, also the way that you move the jaw forward, you could accentuate the advancement of the lower jaw to improve the chin contour. So aesthetically, it should be an enhancement. You know, we're almost running out of time, so let's open it up for live questions. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. So now, if you want to ask Dr. Lee a question, please press star six to unmute yourself and just state your name, and, and you can ask away. Sometimes people are shy. Hi there. It's uh, James Skinner. Um, I've heard sometimes that people have problems with their ears after MMA surgery. Have you run into this at all? Uh, temporarily, because the swelling of the uh, throat, people could have some ear pain. That's mainly due to sw swelling. That and sometimes people could have uh, uh, kind of a uh, you know popping type of it due to sort of middle ear uh, sort of swelling, and and that that will go away. Hello, doctor. Yes. Uh, yes, my name's Ken, and uh, I just have two questions. Uh, one, I was wondering about the smile technique. Um, what do you think about that as far as for tongue reduction? Well, um, it may help some, but uh, I don't think it's uh, it's a game changer, unfortunately. Okay. And yeah, I've had some limited experience with that, and very, very few select patients. Um, it, it does make a difference, but I agree with Dr. Dr. Lee that it doesn't it doesn't cure you. Okay. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I think yeah. you know. Um, I think I think what what everyone's hoping for is a procedure that is not as invasive as the MMA, and but but helps along with the palate. Um, they're not there. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, the, my my other question is kind of similar. Is about um, earlier, I guess the radio frequency for the tongue uh, reduction. Uh, I, I guess you were pretty uh, high on that over the years. Have you become less, less, I guess, high on that or less? That's uh, you're absolutely right. It's because the data. Initially, the the tongue uh, reduction is uh, the data was pretty good, but over over time, you know, we had um, greater um, experience. It, it's 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 not unlike the smile procedure. It's not unlike the other procedures. They do something, uh, but it's not nearly as predictable, and um, the improvement is it's it's not a game changer. Patients still need to have mo ha have MMA, so it's. You know, I actually do very little radio frequency now. One of the other problems with the radio frequency is that um, because you need so many different treatments, that patients kind of either lose interest or they, they don't want to go through that many more treatments. Um, and that's the experience that I had when I first started doing it. So that's why I don't do it either myself anymore. Yeah. And I think that's what some of these papers are saying, that many of these patients didn't follow up for their final two or three treatments. Right. And the ones that did go to four or five treatments did better than the ones that only got one or two. Yeah. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. So I guess we'll end it. It's, uh, it's coming up on the top of the hour. So, Dr. Lee, how can um, people find out more information about you or some of the surgeries that you perform? Well, uh, they can look on. Uh, there's actually have a website. It actually has a lot of information on it. It's uh, it's sleepapneasurgery.com and it has a, it sort of goes over sleep apnea and a lot of a lot of the surgical techniques. Oh, thanks a lot, Dr. Lee. You're it welcome. Such, it was such a great pleasure to have you on the show and I think I think everyone agrees that we learned so much, including myself. Well thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Great. So that's it for tonight's expert interview with Dr. Keezy Lee. 
For more information about this program, or if you have any questions or comments, please visit uh, my website at drstevenpark.com, which is D-O-C-T-O-R-S-T-E-V-E-N-P-A-R-K.com. This is Dr. Stephen Park, and until next time, goodbye. Thank you.